Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my topic for today is Applied Weed Ecology, Why Weeds Grow in Ways to Observe Them. As Patrick said, I'm with the Horticulture Research Forum at University of Kentucky. Uh, this information, however, is based on a general summary of concepts from sustainable agriculture in my previous work as an agricultural specialist and horticulture. Consultant. So let's see if we can get that transition. Next slide, let's try this. Patrick, you might want to advance that for me. Let's see that. that come over? Hang on. Okay. Topics for today um, plant succession and disturbance. Weeds as indicators of soil conditions, weeds as mineral accumulators, and weed response to nature signals. Okay, okay, I got control on that now, Patrick. Thanks. Okay, here we go. There's a general concept illustration of ecological succession. So that is described as the progressive change in species composition of an ecosystem over time. And here's the general look. This. For example, let's say a uh, glacier moves through a valley, carves out everything, leaves the exposed soil, or a volcanic eruption occurs. And this is the natural progression over time where exposed rocks are inhabited by micans and microbial organisms that then move into a pioneer stage of plants that progressively change into perennial vegetation shrubs. In trees. This this illustration probably from, uh, uh, developed by someone who lives in the northeastern United States with sugar maples and beech. If every other part of the country, every region would have a different species composition. Okay, let's see if we can get that change there. Okay, now from part of the country I'm from, Texas and Oklahoma, the prairie was is the climax. Uh, vegetation, and here is uh, an example from the work of Dr. Elroy Rice at the University of Oklahoma, who who did a series of studies in the 1960s and 70s on abandoned fields. So these were originally in prairies, and they put into agriculture, and then they were abandoned. So what uh, Dr. Rice found was that the pioneer stage was composed of a weedy species that lasted for two or three years, and then it transitioned into an annual grass stage that lasted a span of 9 to 13 years, and then it, uh, a perennial bunch grass stage that lasted from 30 to 50 years, and finally it revert back to a climax prairie, which is a prairie being an ecosystem of hundreds of species of grasses and legumes and forests. forests. Uh, now, the interesting thing about Dr. Rice is he's well known in wheat science for his work in allelopathy. He wrote the book, and so allelopathy is the harmful effect of one plant on another through production of chemical compounds, and it is a driving mechanism for the shift in species composition and long duration of vegetative stages. So, fascinating that uh, people who work in wheat science are very interested in the pathy, but the work actually came out of studying uh, the studies on prairie succession. So minor, minor delay on the transition. Let's try that. Just a second. Patrick, I'm going to transfer that to you if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so here, here's uh, secondary succession. Here's, here's the forest fire that Smokey the Bear would not be happy about, and so it sets the, resets the stage of succession. So this is uh, basically any kind of disturbance, such as fire, uh, especially tillage in uh, cropland agriculture, overgrazing, drought. All these disturbances can induce a secondary succession and reset the stage for pioneer species, in other words, weeds, to start flourishing. And so here you can see that how it's all set back. So let's go to the next slide, Patrick. 
And here, here is the tillage. Here's the fire that is the disturbance. And in cropland, uh, row crop agriculture, vegetable production, where tillage is a necessary part of the practice, we're always resetting the stage for ecological succession. And that's why we will always have weeds to deal with when we're uh, having to manage the soil with some kind of tillage to prepare the soil. And so why? Well, Aristotle said that nature abhors a vacuum. And so that's one of the things, that's one of the roles of weeds in ecosystems. If they respond to signals, uh, the soil is exposed and they recolonize and cover the soil and therefore perform important ecological functions by covering the soil, rooting in, uh, and uh, starting this stage of succession to, to occur. And so the other thing is whenever, this is a universal concept, is whenever we see a situation with bare soil and sunlight and moisture plus the seed bank, we will have weeds. And that's why tillage resets the stage. Okay, next slide. The other, the other way of looking at succession is more of a, kind of a, a perspective on what you see in the landscape and how vegetation uh, is expressed through factors that that come about. Here's an example of a grass-fed uh, farm that I worked with in Austin, Texas. And this is in the spring of 2012, which was the first year after the, the historic drought of 2011. So here we see the fields covered over completely with burr medic, which uh, was just everywhere in central Texas. All the pastures, all the roadside was incredible. So uh, 2011, this same field looked like a moonscape. It was so dry and barren from the drought. So in this instance, we can we can see burr medic as a lagoon colonizer in response to a disturbance. Okay, next slide. Uh, and here's the same farm the following year. Uh, the second year after the historic drought, and here we see a normal grass-based expression. This is what the farm would normally look like. So this kind of sort of annual observation of how things change and shift in the landscape is another way to uh, observe and think about succession. Okay, next slide. So that here, that leads us to this point, which is that whenever we are, again, we're working in row crop, row crop agriculture and, and vegetable production, because we're employing the tool of tillage for different purposes, we're always resetting the stage, but we come back because that's the natural response. And therefore, uh, that's why, uh, in, for example, this slide illustrating sustainable and organic vegetable production you need an integrated weed management approach. So, for example, these are some of the tools, uh, for example, plastic mulch, uh, widely used by vegetable farmers to control weeds, get the crop off to a good start, uh, crop rotation, cover crops, uh, various specialized cultivation implements like the basket weeder on the lower left, and then even, even more specialized tools like the flame weeder on the lower right. So, this is the term that came out of sustainable agriculture where you have what are known as mini little hammers. And that's putting all these together is what uh, what you achieve. Now, one more point being, here's, a, here's another example. Even on the same farm in the same growing season, uh, you can have excellent, superb weed control on one part of your farm, the way they were planted, the way you got it done, and on another part of the farm, not so good. Uh, so this is the normal consequence of farming. It's a dynamic changing system and basically just uh, you got to roll with it and uh, and we, we start over, put another cover crop in, get it going again. So, okay. Next slide. Okay, here we go. So let's move into our second topic, which is weed those indicators of soil conditions. Okay, next. 
Yeah, here's here's um, some literature from this is uh, more of my practitioner literature at the top, and then we'll look at some more uh, scientific literature on the bottom. But uh, one of the first books that really uh, brought people's attention to uh, weeds uh, with different characteristics and some of their ecological benefits was Joseph Kokunur's book, Weeds Guarding of the Soil. Uh, Professor Kokunur was at the University of Oklahoma for decades. He was a professor of uh, conservation and biology. And uh, his book, in fact, talks about weeds as indicators of soil, the roles they play in the ecosystem, their deep root rooting characteristics, their ability to bring minerals up from the subsurface. Charles Walters' book, Weeds Control Without Poisons, uh, written from the Eco Agricultural Experience, published by Acres USA. He gets into some, some things like uh, how, how weeds uh, are indicators of the lack of calcium or phosphorus and compacted soil and so forth. And then Aaron Free Pfeiffer's book, Weeds and What They Tell. And Dr. Pfeiffer was a microbiologist, well known for his work in biodynamic agriculture. And, and again, he gets into characteristics of weeds. But interestingly, at the tail end of the book, he talks about some of the beneficial properties of stinging nettle and chamomile and equisetum uh, and their influence on other plants, you know, positive benefits. So, and then actually, this concept of plants as indicators is very old. Pliny the Elder was an early. Uh, Roman uh, agricultural writer in his book, Natural History. He describes how you can look at certain types of vegetation as a, as a good indicator of where to plant peach trees. And then Frederick Clements, uh, one of the famous pioneers of, of, in fact, ecological succession and clients in mass communities, wrote a really significant, big, uh, thick book on plant indicators and their relationship to plant communities and processes. And then Helen Cannon, who was with the U.S. Geological, Geological Survey over a period of decades, wrote a number of reports on plant indicators, for example, as hydro indicators of groundwater, and even uh, geobotany, where plants are used for essentially prospecting minerals. Next slide. So, and here's, here's some of the indicators. Um, so you you're, say you are out on a farm and you look at the land, you, you look down there and you see smart wheat growing down there in abundance and maybe some marsh horsetail. It's a very good indicator of a moist, uh, possibly poor drain soil. Uh, same thing, let's say, as the soil, say you're in the Ozarks or the eastern United States and you see broom sedge growing out there in a pasture. It is in, it's a real quick indicator that you're dealing with an acid soil. Maybe it has pH 5.5, and it's indicated that it's got low fertility, probably needs to be lined. Same thing with blackberry. If you're in the Pacific Northwest and uh, blackberries are rambling and taking over the whole hillside, very low acid, acid pH. Uh, then other, other soils, for example, compacted soils, maybe you'll see goosegrass or not weed, uh, quick indicators. And then uh, obviously you, you can see plants that are growing in a typical of a shady condition. And then other plants that say lamb's quarters uh, where a pile of manure was sitting and now is growing abundantly is an indicator of uh, high fertility. And, and then on the, in the reverse then, if you see mullein growing on a right of way, <laughs> excuse me, a utility easement, it's an indicator, indicator of low fertility. So uh, Stuart Hill's paper that he published through Ecological Agricultural Projects at McGill University was one of, the, one, of the, one of the early ones that got a lot of people thinking about this. So, okay, next, Patrick. Now, our next topic is uh, weeds as mineral accumulators. Okay, I think I got that. And Okay, here's um, some, again, practitioner literature on the top, some scientific literature on the bottom, but there was a series of books that came out from Europe. Uh, for example, Newman Turner's book, Fertility Pastures, uh, describing herbal days, and 
uh, in the Cotswold Seed uh, catalog, also as a supplier of uh, species mixtures for pastures, uh, known as an arbole. And these are uh, pasture seed mixes that include some typical forage grasses, but also include a number of broadleaf plants uh, that typically farmers wouldn't uh, plant or they, they view them as weeds, but uh, various herbs and broadleaf. And uh, this early concept coming out of the organic agriculture experience was that different plants and broadleaf accumulate minerals to a greater degree than their grass counterparts. And so the concept there being is that provide the livestock with a range of broad spectrum minerals that were healthy. And so that's just a natural way for uh, getting that accomplished on the farm. And then Robert Kirk's book that came out in the 1980s, Designing and Maintaining Your Edible Landscape Naturally, was one of the early books that talked about dynamic accumulators. And these, again, are our concept of plants that uh, accumulate minerals to a greater degree. And so that uh, has been popular in permaculture. So then uh, some scientific literature, uh, Linda Foster's paper came out in the 80s in biological agriculture and horticulture, herbs and pastures, the experience in Great Britain from 1850s to the present. And essentially, he was talking about these herbal legs. And so, and, and likewise, down the bottom, Harrington's paper, New Zealand Plant Protection in 2006. Mineral composition and nutritive value of some common pasture weeds was a kind of a blend of uh, looking at herbal legs and then common pasture weeds. And then Jonas Bingris' paper in 1953 in the Agronomy Journal is really considered to be a classic in the field. This is chemical composition of weeds and accompanying crop plants. So, so let's see if I can transition that slide. Go ahead, Patrick, on that. All right, here we go. Here's here's uh, Bingers' uh, data from his paper. Uh, this is the chemical composition of onion weeds. This, the sampling date was in July at the time that onion plants were ready for harvest. And we're looking at the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium values in percent dry weight. Uh, let's look at, um, so let's look at nitrogen. Onion plant had 2% nitrogen, which is pretty, pretty normal. Uh, then we look at pigweed. Lance quarters, smartweed, chickweed, purslane, crabgrass, and barnyard grass all had substantially higher amounts of nitrogen in their leaf tissue. This is not st statistically done, but it, does, it is re uh, reporting from some lab work. And then phosphorus, the same thing. Uh, onion ha has 0.28% um, phosphorus, and the rest of the weeds have higher degrees. Potassium is probably uh, the most uh, uh, striking difference. Uh, onion tissue, 2.23% potassium, and then uh, weed species substantially higher. So all the way up to or per slain had 8.43% potassium. Actually, this is one of the, the first indicators of this occurrence that I came across was a paper written about weeds uh, and aquatic species that could be grown, and harvested, dried, and sold as a slow-release organic fertilizer for potassium because of this phenomenon. Okay, next slide. And then here's the four-year herbal lay. This is Newman Turner's original. This is a mixture from Cotswold Seed. And we, we if you notice, they've got uh, Rye grass, orchard grass, timothy, fescue grasses, plus red clover, white clover, outside clover, bird's foot truffle, same foin, sweet clover, chicory, burnet, yarrow, sheep's parsley, and plantain. And that's the mixture that goes out there below. Okay, next chapter. And here's Harrington's analysis. Now, this would be more recent, 2006. You can assume this was done more methodically. 
and it's uh, probably with uh, better lab instrumentation and statistics. And in this instance, they're looking at ryegrass and clover, chicory, plantain, which are pretty good uh, species for a forage mixture. But then you throw in some leaves like dog thistle, dandelion, buttercup, and Yorkshire fog, which I don't even know what that is. But uh, if we look at nitrogen, no, no difference. However, look at some of these others, uh, phosphorus, chicory, plantain, dandelion, buttercup, or significantly higher, no difference on potassium. We see differences on sulfur, we see and calcium, magnesium, and sodium. And okay, next slide. And then likewise on micronutrients, some differences on manganese, copper, zinc, boron, cobalt. None on selenium or iron, that's surprising, and then a little bit on molybdenum. Okay, next slide. And then uh, kind of wrapping this up, what, here's another. Here's one of the reasons is um, what's going on met, uh, on the metabolic level is that plants exude a number of compounds, and this table shows amino acids and organic acids, sugars, vitamins, enzymes, and so forth, but it's the organic acids and enzymes that are really etching out and cleaving off minerals from the parent plant material, and then weeds are absorbing those, bringing them from lower layers in the soil, bringing them to the surface, and through uh, the action of dyeing, senescing, and decomposing, releasing these nutrients back to the soil surface, and therefore through the crop plant. Okay, then finally, let's move on to the last two slides, and this one is nature signals. Okay, next slide. And here's the last one, which is, this is um, when you see weeds, there's a, a opportunity. We, uh, farmers uh, spend a lot of time in the field, they have a lot of time to think. This is why they're very innovative. But here's some, here's some thought uh, processes that you might uh, engage in while you're working out there is observing, for example, uh, weeds growing on a manure pile, such as Jimson weed, which just universally seems to grow on the manure pile. So, question is, is it because the manure is full of weed seed? Is it because the manure stimulates the seed bank? Do you, does Jimson weed respond to nitrates? Does Jimson weed respond to raw humic substances? Okay, and then in cropland weeds, for example, are, are they growing here because the soil is compacted? Is the soil flush with nitrates? Does the soil lack phosphorus or calcium? And so, uh, it could be any of any of above, but that, that over time you may develop a pattern in your mind and use those uh, observations as a tool for managing things on your farm and making adjustments to your soil management program. And there you go, there you go, Patrick. One more. Thank you very much.